We're ready for the reboot closing session. Um, this year, uh, featuring a person who we're very honored and very pleased that he came all the way here to share uh, his thoughts about action and uh, what a group of people like us could do. So, Bruce Sterling. So, uh, thanks for having me up here. I always wanted to see Thomas and his Nordic geeks in action. And I have to say that, you know, having been here two days, it's about what I expected. And, and that was very gratifying. Okay, so, you know, you've been through a lot in two days, and, uh, you know, the last speech in an event of this kind can't possibly be too short. Uh, there will be no graphics. Uh, those of you who are into graphics, I would like you to look on Google for... Uh, set of graphics called Studies in Atemporality. These are like some graphics I did earlier. If you're like a graphics guy, you've got to have graphics during a speech. You look on my Flickr set, Studies in Atemporality. I really need some help with this Flickr set. I know you weren't going to pay any attention to my graphics anyway. You're very bright people, easily distracted. Go on to Bruce Sterling's Flickr set, look for Studies in Atemporality. You can help me out there. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, what's great about your event? Well, you know, it really matches up to its billing. It's reboot. What's not so great about your event? Obviously, you've had 11 reboots. <laughs> 11 reboots, people. When are you going to have a stable, functional system? <laughs> I don't think you're going to get one in your lifetime. Uh, you know, it's like, remember that grand narrative, that grand narrative like we had last year, that like mythic breakthrough interpretative grand narrative. Well, we've got another grand narrative. We like rebooted the other narrative. We've got another paradigm. It's even more destabilizing and subversive than last year's paradigm. Uh, that's problematic. Action, not words. Okay, I'm a novelist. You know, a bunch of words, that is a very tiresome action issue for me. I actually have to deliver a bunch of words, like, you know, 80,000 in a row, and it helps if it makes some sense. Grand future narratives, I do a lot of that. I'm going to give you one. Uh, not just one reboot, I'm going to give you an entire decade, because I think you need to kind of stretch out a little. I'm going to tell you what next decade looks and feels like as a culture. But first, I have to tell you a story, because, you know, you guys are obviously big on myths and stories, and that's my profession. So I'm going to tell you an anecdote about Fiat. Happened to run into this guy in Torino, chief of design for Fiat. So I was at this event where the chief of design for Fiat was there. And he was explaining the design philosophy of Fiat. Now, you may not know that Fiat is actually doing pretty well lately. They basically wrecked Turin when they went broke, but that was 20 years ago, and now they've like come up with a better design scheme. And what's it about? Well, it's about the Fiat 500, which is, you know, a big hit for Fiat. It's this like cute little car and kind of beloved of people of your generation and really kind of selling like hotcakes. And uh, Fiat made so much money off of this, they tried to buy General Motors Europe, couldn't quite make it before the bankruptcy, but they did buy Chrysler. So, you know, Fiat's made enough money off of their car that they're, like, moving into Detroit, which is like the American Turin, except a hundred times worse off. So our, our, our friend, the uh, chief of design from, uh, from, from Fiat, was addressing an audience about this size, and he was explaining why this car was such a hit. And, well, you know, it's 50 years old, and that's why it's so contemporary. It's an old, new Fiat. I mean, it's a skewomorph. It's just the same picture of the old Fiat. It's just kind of put back into a novel, but not exactly futuristic, but at least best-selling car package. It's a powerfully well-designed, very popular, contemporary car, which is of now and also 50 years old. So I was very curious about this, so I asked him, I, you know, I stood up, I, I asked him in public, it's like, okay, given that the Fiat 500 is a big success for you, and in fact, an even bigger success than the original Fiat 500, 
where do you plan to go from here? I mean, what's the future of the Fiat 500? Are you going to release the next car that came after the Fiat 500 historically? Because there was a car that came after the Fiat 500, and presumably it was an improvement over the Fiat 500, right? So if you're going to revive this old car, you're going to revive the next car that came after that car. And he said, no, this was an important issue, and they'd spent a lot of time thinking about it. And what they were doing was they had introduced the Fiat 500, and they were watching the demographic groups who had picked up on the Fiat 500. And they were looking at post-consumer alteration of the Fiat 500, and then they were going to professionalize that, right? In other words, they were like young soccer hooligan tough guys who sort of toughed out their Fiat 500, special little hubcaps and so forth, racing stripes. So they were going to do that. And then there was like the women's group who liked the Fiat 500 because it was cute, and they were doing like cuter versions with sort of, you know, anime dangling dolls on the rear view mirror and, you know, maybe some hot pearlized pink, and they were tracking that and they were going to adopt that too. In other words, they were going to move the Fiat 500 into emergent demographic groups. This was the way forward. They were looking for emergent consumer groups and they were going to move the car into their social space year by year. And I thought this was a really clever idea. And I thought, I'm in a society that's going to do a lot of this. And I thought, this really is a terrible and scary paradigm of the future. Because it's very difficult for us to construe that kind of activity as progress. Everybody for 200 years, almost since the 1200s, have known what progress means. They know what it means to be progressive, and they know what it means to be futuristic. You get more scientific knowledge, you create more tools, you make more jobs, you master nature, you get more power, cheaper power, you struggle for a better life for your children, you're looking for health, prosperity, material security, shelter, bigger, faster, stronger, knowing more. Everybody knows that's progress, that's not what we're going to get. The actual objective situation looks more like this. No money, scarcity, financial collapse, collapsed states, general precarity, an energy crisis, low-intensity global warfare, and a rapidly advancing climate crisis. That's, that's the situation on the ground. You know, and people ask, where did the future go? Were these sort of glamorous versions of the future? Why are we, okay, we're deliberately choosing to move away from that and into a non-20th century space. We're moving into a situation with generation Xers in power in a depression, a depression where people are afraid of the sky. That's what the next decade actually looks like. And you're going to live there. Now, I just saw John Thackra, who's a design critic. I'm a big fan of this guy. He declared in public that the future, the word future, is an old paradigm. And the word future will soon go out of use. I'm inclined to agree with the guy, actually. I'm not sure that the word future goes out of use. And obviously, we have some kind of absolute future. I mean, we're not going to go back to the year 1950. The clock is ticking. The pages are going to fall off the calendar. You know, in a decade, it's going to be 2019. We'll be 10 years older. You'll be 10 years older. These are all solid things. It's more like a mythos of the future or a structure of the future or a belief in the future. It's just not the same. And it's just not being attacked from the same area at all. It's being attacked from a different kind of area. Uh, you know, which I call atemporality. And I'm still working on this. You know, I'm not quite prepared to do a big pitch on atemporality. William Gibson's a big fan of this. He's working on a book right now called Zero History. He and I are kind of mulling over atemporality, but it's going to take us a while to work on this. I mean, atemporality, if you wanted the bumper sticker, it's like steampunk with metaphysics. And that's a very authorly thing to do. It's sort of like a super kind of culture critic thing. 
you know, if you want to help me, you're like a theory guy, literary guy, great. Uh, you know, send email. But that's not what I'm going to talk about here. Um, I want to talk about the next decade and sort of what comes after your event. I mean, what it's going to feel like to live through the next 10 years. Uh, and it does not feel like progress. However, it does not feel like conservatism either. There's neither progress nor conservatism because there's sort of no, nothing left to conserve and no direction in which to progress. So what you get is transition. Transition to nowhere as they would call it, in the Eastern Bloc. Transition to nowhere, very common experience in Eastern European states. No big boom bubbles. We might have one. I don't expect to see them. I think we kind of had our fill of those. Bad weather, really a given. Bad weather happening much faster than we expected. And global emergent change. So now I'm going to describe a futurist quadrant for the 20 teens. Except I, I wouldn't call it a futurist quadrant. I would now call it a strategic forecasting quadrant because that's what futurists call themselves when they're no longer allowed to be futurists. Suddenly they become strategic forecasters. So here's like your strategic forecasting quadrant. We're sort of dividing the future up into four interest groups, four possible worlds. Number one, quadrant number one, crisis capitalism for aging baby boomers. You're going to see a lot of this over the next decade. Boomers, they're getting old, they're kind of feeble. They're, you know, they're not major actors, but they've got all the votes, so they're not going to get out of the way. But they're going to become more and more incapable and sort of more and more attached to crotchety fantasies uh, and more and more detached from any ability to get anything coherent done. So, you know, crisis capitalism for aging broke baby boomers. Kind of the majority outlook. Outlook number two, BRICS. The BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China. You can write Russia out of there if you don't like oil. Brazil, India, China. The emerging states, emerging to nowhere. The developing countries, developing in no direction in particular. Sopping up other people's technology. They're globalizing. They're not progressing. They're not developing. They're just globalizing. Shock of the old. Fundamentalists are in that quarter. Christian fundies, Islamic fundies. You put them in power, they never do anything. Nothing happens. They have no policy. They don't improve anything. They don't change the structure of society in any way except to ruin whatever is left of the economy and, and politics. So they're not really a transformative force, you know, except, except for ruin. So, you know, never mind those. I mean, the vast majority of the human race is in those two quadrants. Old, rich world, emerging semi-poor world. I want to talk about the quadrants of direct interest to you, sort of the area where you guys are going to be working. Reboot in power. What's it look like, reboot in power? Gen Xers actually running things, sort of. Um, what is the cultural temperament of this era? Well, you know, I think it's got a good two-word summary. Dark euphoria. Dark euphoria is what the 20 teens feels like. Things are just sort of falling apart. You can't believe the possibilities. It's like anything is possible, but you never realize you're going to have to dread it so much. It's like a kind of leap into the unknown where you're sort of falling toward Earth at a 900 kilometers an hour, and then you realize there's like no Earth there. That's a dark euphoria feeling. And it's sort of the cultural temperament of the, of the coming decade. And it comes in two flavors, top end and low end. And everybody in this room is sort of schismed between top end and low end, because that's the nature of your particular demographic. The top end we can describe as gothic high tech. Let me explain to you what gothic high tech is like. And Gothic High Tech, you're Steve Jobs. And you've built an iPhone, which is a brilliant technical innovation. But you also had to sneak off to Tennessee to get a liver transplant because you're dying of something secret and horrible. <laughs> and you're a captain of American industry. You're not like, you know, some... General Motors kind of guy. On the contrary, you're a guy who's really kind of like 
got both hands on the steering wheel of a functional car. <laughs> but, you know, you're still gothic high tech because, you know, death is waiting. And, you know, not a sort of kindly death either, but a really kind of sinister, creeping, tainted wells of Silicon Valley kind of super fun thing that steals upon you month by month and that you have to hide from the public and from the bloggers and from the shareholders. And you just kind of grit your teeth and pull out the next one. A heroic story, really, but very gothic. Really something that belongs in kind of an 18th century horror novel. Kind of the man in the castle figure. Or uh, from a political aspect, the ultimate gothic high-tech figure, Nicolas Sarkozy. You're Nicolas Sarkozy, you're brilliant, you're polyethnic, you have no ideology. You don't really care about any particular line, political line, and you have no alternative. You've sucked all the air out of the political room. It's just all about you. The only conceivable alternative you have is like Danny the Red Cone Bendit. You're like this burnt out 68er guy. And there's very little you can do about Sarkozy because there's really no way to debate him. I mean, if you debate him, you just make him stronger. If you ignore him, he simply steals your clothes. So the only thing you can do is wait and hope that he changes his mind. And he will, because he will cheerfully campaign against himself. <laughs> he will reboot, you know, in, in six months or eight months. It's like, oh, well, you didn't like my gangster bling bling Sarkozy? Well, how about my top end literary guy Sarkozy? You didn't like wife number one, wife number two? How about the new one who's like the cool folk singer? You know, and Barack Obama is a gothic high-tech figure. I know, you know, the Europeans are totally enamored of this guy. I don't blame you for that. He's a Chicago machine politician, all right? He's not freaking Václav Havel. <laughs> He's an ethnically indeterminate community organizer <laughs> with a massive fundraising digital machine. You're an American, you get email from Obama, it's like, we'd love to give you European-style health care. Please send us a whole lot of cash. <laughs> That's what it's like. I mean, they have their gothic moments. I mean, Barak's about hope, but, you know, he's about hope, but if, if he's suddenly removed from the situation, all hope has been sucked from the room. Just say Obama trips over a skateboard, breaks his neck. Where's the hope? You see any other sources of it? <laughs> you saw after this Air France, Air France crash, the Brazilian airliner crashes, Sarkozy comes out, gets on television. Why? Because it was an opportunity to be on television. <laughs> and what does he say? He said, I told them the truth. And he did tell them the truth. And it was a very gothic truth. I mean, they blew up in midair and everybody died. You know, and you can see the guy rehearsing his ability to convey news of this kind year after year after year. He's going to be really good at it. These are gothic high-tech figures, people who position themselves in the narrative rather than building any permanent infrastructure. That's what you've been telling each other to do all day. That's why you love these guys. They're positioning themselves in the narrative rather than building any permanent infrastructure. They're cheerleaders. They're not leaders. They're cheerleaders. And if the narrative, hap narrative happens to be poverty, floods, air crashes, drug addiction, infidelity, whatever, they're going to be good to go. Oh, it's like the sort of Gen X temperament, really. I mean, why are Gen X goths? Why are they goths rather than, you know, hippies, beatniks? Why do they like to dress up like dead people? <laughs> that's their temperament. I mean, when you're a young goth, you dress up like a dead person because that's something grown-ups do. 
dying. <laughs> but if you're an adult Gen Xer and you're dressed up as a goth, it's like, don't blame me because I'm already dead. <laughs> I'm not morally responsible. I'm not a political actor. It's not my fault. Look, I'm a vampire. You know, don't they blame me, I voted for blood, oh, whatever. It's gothic. And what is the down, so what's the, what's the other side of this? I mean, this is the flip side of gothic high-tech. The flip side of gothic high-tech is down market, and it's called favela chic. Favela chic. What is favela chic? Favela chic is when you have lost everything material everything you built and everything you had, but you're still wired to the gills and really big on Facebook. <laughs> That's favela chic. You lost everything, you have no money, you have no career, you have no health insurance, you're not even sure where you live, you don't have children, and you have no steady relationship or any set of dependable friends, and it's hot. <laughs> it's a really cool place to be. MySpace is a favela. Have you ever been to a Brazilian favela? It basically politically represents the structure of MySpace. You've got this remote, distant, old-school Brazilian tyrant, anti-democratic, wicked mogul, pays no attention to you, supposedly owns the whole show, but the whole shebang is going south in a hurry. It's been out-competed by some other economy, there's kind of nothing happening there. You have no civil rights in my space. You can't go anywhere in my space. You can't organize in my space. You can't make money in my space. You can't have a hut in my space. And you live in the hut until they pull the plug. That's a favela. It's made of instructables. A favela is an emergent structure. It's made out of corrugated tin and breeze blocks. Every slogan you have here, practically every slogan, fits perfectly in a favela. Action is cheaper than control. That's a favela slogan. It's cheaper to just build the hut and move into it than it is to like try and like sue you to leave or get anything done. Just fucking do it, that's a favela slogan. So fix it, that's a favela slogan. Always in beta. Of course, a favela is always in beta. <laughs> you can't insure it. You can't get title to it. You can't raise kids in it. There's no inspection of the water, the heating, the electricity. It's a slum. You built it yourself with play labor, but politically, it's a slum. It's a squelette. A squelette is a Brazilian high rise where they built the internal structure but they never managed to put any utilities or a wall on it. Kind of a see-through building. Because it's pretty easy to just throw up the girders and, you know, the cement part. And then some of them are 80 stories high, 40 stories high. They just have no, no skin. And people squat them. They go in there with the breeze blocks and the corrugated tin, and they're in a high-rise favela, the squelette. Or a stuffed animal which is the European equivalent, very big on stuffed animals here. This building is a stuffed animal. This is not a place where people like overturn society and throw it on its ear. This is like some kind of smokestack industry. I mean, somebody was in here like making big stuff, burning coal, you know, bread, beer, whatever. The building's been repurposed. It's like an extinct animal, like, uh, you know, a European aurochs. And it's still got the hide and the hooves and the big glass eyes. And then you come in here and you sit on your stackable European designer chairs, which vanish without a trace as soon as you leave the building. This is a stuffed animal. It's not an accident that you live in stuffed animals, that you meet in stuffed animals. This is what the next 10 years of your life looks like. <laughs> you like stuffed animals. Stuffed animals are the curse of your generation, but they're also your frontier. It's the place where they're like not paying attention. Like a civilized squat. You can get a lot done in a stuffed animal. There isn't any other place to go in Europe. There isn't any other place to go on the planet. 
The unsustainable is the only frontier you have. The wreckage of the unsustainable, that's your heritage. And here you are. It's the old new. You're in an old new structure. It's a steampunk appropriation. There's your steam. Big chimney out there. It's an urban intervention. I'm surprised you're not planting tomato gardens here. I don't know why you want to plant tomato gardens. If you had ever actually been gardeners in your lives, you would know that this was hard, dirty, patient work. Urban agriculture, not for you. <laughs> cell, cell phone uprisings led by conservatives, that's, that's more your line of work. So, um, you know, I, I want to give you some practical advice here because I know it's like the theme of your event. And even though I'm a novelist, you know, I, I, on occasion I do practical things when absolutely forced to do it. Like, I was shamed by Matt Webb's 100-hour speech. I know what I ought to be studying. I'm going to have to go do it now. Um, so, I, you know, I want to give you some good advice, practical advice, on environmentalism. And specifically, geek-friendly, bright green environmentalism, because you know, it's one of your biggest problems. I mean, you didn't do it yourselves. You know, you're inheriting 200 years of atmospheric abuse, but that's not going to get you off the hook, and you have your own successors to worry about. Okay, I want to offer you a general principle here. And for a Gothic generation like yours, this is going to be painful for you. I mean, really kind of a cognitive upset. Stop acting dead. Now, you think that acting dead is a virtue because you've kind of been trained to behave as if you were dead for a long time. And it actually appeals to your temperament as a generation. And it's kind of your default position, really. But you have to stop it, because hair shirt green, which is you know, most of the things that you had on your action list there, hair shirt green just changes the polarity of the 20th century. It's just the opposite of consumer culture. It's like Satanism for a computer for consumer culture, and, and all Satanists are actually Christians. It's not really a different way to live, you know, and it's not something that's going to fulfill you. Now, how do you know if you're acting dead? Well, there's a test for this. It's the great-grandfather principle. You're saying, I'm going to do something really morally worthwhile that'll make me feel proud of myself, but does your dead great-grandfather do a better job of it than you. For instance, saving water. Okay, water is indestructible, first of all. You cannot possibly damage water unless you turn it into hydrogen and oxygen and just spontaneously recombines. But you're trying to save water because, you know, you're told to save water. All right, your dead great-grandfather is saving more water than you. You cannot possibly save any more water than a dead guy. He's greener than you in that regard. <laughs> Saving electrical power. Okay, you should be using less power. Power is bad. You need a lower footprint. Okay, your grandfather is not using any electrical power. He's much greener than you. You cannot compete with that. You should move into a smaller apartment. Your grandfather's in a very, very small apartment. <laughs> It's underground, there's no lighting, there's no heating, he doesn't have any broadband. <laughs> recycling, okay, recycling is useful in some ways. Your grandfather is literally being recycled. <laughs> you can't actually out-recycle your dead grandfather. And furthermore, in a pretty short amount of time, compared to the lengths of the problems you're tackling, you're going to be dead, like your grandfather. You'll be saving everything at that point. I mean, you might be alive 70, 80, 90 years. You're going to be dead for hundreds of millions of years. Billions of years of saving water. Billions of years of, you know, having a light carbon footprint. It's carbon sequestration. You're full of carbon, they've buried you. So you need to do things that you can do while alive. I mean, do things you can do while alive. If your grandfather's doing a better job at it, you can put that aside for later, when you're dead like him.
Now let me explain how it is that you can go about doing this, and it really is a different material way of life than any in the 20th century. And it's, it's sort of a geek-friendly approach to consumption. And it's about objects and services, you know, especially objects, devices. You know, and I think your temperament is actually quite close to this, and this is an area where I think you can do a lot of good work in ways that your grandfather and dead grand great grandfather could not have done. For people of your generation, and especially for your children, objects are printouts. They're really best understood as printouts. They're not treasures, they're not things you want, they're not things to stockpile, they're not material wealth. They're basically frozen social relationships. That's what these chairs are and this building and that duct tape and the rest of it. You need to think of them not in terms of like, oh, I have this pen and I must keep my pen. You need to think of these objects in terms of hours of time and volumes of space. You know, and I know that sounds very science fictional, but it's also a good design approach to it. Because if you're picking these things up, moving them around, all these positions, this material clutter in your environment, you're washing it, you're storing it, you're heating it, you're trying to keep it from its inevitable decay, you're curating it, you're looking after it. These possessions are really embodied social relationships. They're all made by people, designed by people, sold by people, promulgated by people, advertised by people. They're a whole set of relationships that happen to have some particular material form. And it's not hard for you to get other ones or new ones. Now, you can argue that you should economize and just buy really cheap things to try and dematerialize and not be materialistic and content yourself with things that are very cheap or very organic. That's not the way forward. You know, economizing is not social. When you economize, you're starving somebody else. Really. If you don't give them money, they don't have any money. And if they don't offer you any money, you don't get any money. I mean, that's not a social flow or a share or, you know, or even a sociable relationship. What you need to do is reassess the objects in your space and time. And I'm going to explain to you how to do this. The king of objects, the monarch among objects, are not fancy objects. They're not high-tech objects. They're not organic objects. They're not biological objects. They're everyday objects, things that you're with every day. Whatever is in your time most, what's taking up most of your time, or in your space most, the stuff that's closest to your skin, on your skin, inside your skin, in intimate areas, space and time, that's what's going on. That's where it's at. That's where it's happening. Common, everyday objects. You need to have the best possible common, everyday objects. Number one, a bed. You're spending a third of your life in the thing. You never take it seriously. Rich people have great beds. You should go out and get, like, the best bed you can get. Just, you know, money is no object. On a per hour rental basis, bed, super important. The sheets, the pillows, pretty high up there, too. Spending, you know, you, you gotta, every morning when you wake up, you will thank me for this. <laughs> now, I, I know it, you're like resisting it. It's like, it's like, oh, well, why? Why am I buying a fancy bed? It's, it's bad for me. I, I, I'm being taken outside of my comfort zone. You live in the thing. <laughs> Get rid of the wedding china. Get rid of the, of the, you know, the, the, the tuxedos, the, the exercise equipment you never use, the things you never touch, the heaps of things, the heaps of material objects in your closet, and God help you, your storage locker. <laughs> Sell them all. Buy a bed. Get a real bed. Get a chair. I shouldn't have to tell people who work with computers to get a chair. No, they'd rather whine about their wrists blowing out, their spines blowing out. They wouldn't come up with a chair that would cost them maybe 50 cents an hour over the first you know, amortizable period. The world is full of beautifully designed ergonomic chairs. Get a real damn chair. Sell the other chairs, the fancy chairs, the couch, the other stuff thing, your grandmother's chair, you couldn't help. Get rid of your grandmother's chair. 
It was never properly built to begin with. <laughs> get rid of it. Get rid of it if you don't use it. If you haven't touched it in a year, get rid of it immediately. Sell it. Buy real things you really use. Now, you're going to be having a lot fewer things, but the actual quality of your life will skyrocket if you have real shoes, real underwear. Women, if you use actual cosmetics instead of, you know, shoplifting cheap cosmetics because you're deeply conflicted about, you know, your impulses. Go ahead. It's on your lips. It's on your eyelids. Get real cosmetics. I'm going to explain to you how you do this, because it's really kind of a hard karma. I've done it like three times. I'm an author. I'm pursued by books. You know, things accumulate. Periodically, I have to scrape the barnacles off, but it's doable. It's doable, and it's very hackerly. First, you need to, like, make lists. Hackers love lists. Chart. You can make a flow chart. Flow chart it. If that makes you any happier. Four varieties of items. Beautiful things, emotionally important things, tools, devices, and appliances that efficiently perform some useful function, and category four, everything else. Let me repeat these four things. Number one, beautiful things. Number two, things that have some emotional meaning for you. Number three, your tools, devices, and appliances. Number four, everything else. How do you know if it belongs in category number one? Beautiful things. Well, you know, beautiful things are very important. Is it so beautiful that you're going to show it to your friends? Is it on display? Are you going to share its beauty with people in your immediate area? Your wife, your husband, your drinking buddies, your pals, the techno DJ from downstairs, you know, whatever. Is it so beautiful that you're driven to exhibit it, to show it off, and to share it with others? It's not that beautiful. It's not beautiful. Gotta go. Take its picture. Make sure you get the barcode. If for some reason you want it back, just virtualize it. Put it in your thumb drive. It does not belong in your immediate vicinity. You weren't born with it. You're not going to die with it. It's got to go. Number two, emotionally important. Okay, we're all the slaves of our objects. You're going to be in there, you're going to think, oh, yeah, Sterling says I should, like, uh, you know, like, uh, annotate and, like, catalog my stuff and remove the things that are basically enslaving me. Oh, but not this, not you, not you, beloved little pancake turner. <laughs> How do you know if it's emotionally important? Are you going to tell anybody else about it? This is your grandfather's watch. Son, he wore this, you know, and I've worn it too, and, you know, it should be for you. Look how well made it was. He carried this in battle. He, he fought for our freedom. Look, there's blood stains on this watch. Does it have a narrative? Is there something you want to tell other people about it, or are you actually its slave? Is it just emotionally blackmailing you because you're used to having it around? If you can't tell anybody about it, there's no associated story, it has no possible emotional meaning for anybody else but you, it doesn't really mean anything to you. Get rid of it, you'll never miss it. Take its picture first, catalog everything about it. You might want to write down the little story, the way it made you feel. It's all right. You can get another one, plenty of junk on eBay. It's just kind of sitting there. You can click it. You can have it. It's not hard. Great-grandfather couldn't do that. Got no eBay. Get it out of your vicinity. Stop dusting it off. Stop heating it up. Stop paying it. Just get it away. And then there's your tools, right? I mean, you're, no, you're losing nothing by getting rid of these things. They have no real meaning for you. You are gaining time and light and space and health by removing these objects from your vicinity. They're social relationships imposed on you by other people. There are powerful forces that put those there for you. Tools, okay, high technical standards. I don't have to preach to you about this. Be very demanding of these tools. Do not make do with broken stuff. You're going to meet lots of hair shirt greens who say, oh, it's perfectly good. Look, it's only a little bit splintery. Put some duct tape on it. You know, it's fine. Do not make do with broken stuff. You have to 
There's nothing more materialistic than doing the same job five times because your tools are inferior. You should understand tools. You should be trying to reward best practices for people. Go out and buy real stuff, stuff that functions. You're knowledgeable people in this area. However, you have to look out for time-sucking beta rollout crap. <laughs> because that's the dark side of your tool fixation. Are you really experimenting with this stuff? You'll, you'll claim that. Oh, look, it's nice. I think I'd better get it. You know, it might be useful. It's sort of keen to have. I've got its sisters and its brothers, and you know, it's in the shrink. It's marked down and must be in my home. Okay, are you really experimenting? How do you know if you're really experimenting? You're working on it methodically, and you're publishing the results. It's not an experiment if you don't publish the results in some verifiable and falsifiable form, okay? I just needed it. No, no, it was mine, mine, mine. Me, shiny tech boy, jackdaw. You know, I had to, like, have it in my underwear drawer. If you're not telling other people about it, you're not experimenting with it. You're enslaved by the thing. Put down the shiny gadget. Go look in the shiny mirror. If you're really experimenting, you got to be sharing the knowledge. Just put it out there. Be brave. Be brave. Tell other people. Share it or stop it. And everything else. Category four, everything else. Virtualize it. Store the data. Get rid of it. Tons of stuff. Tons of stuff. You're going to need help. You're going to be crying hot, bitter tears over this one. Number four, colossal category. Probably 80% of whatever is in your immediate vicinity. It's going to arrive like barnacles. You know, this is a hard discipline. It's a hard thing to do. Really hard. It's not the sort of thing you do on impulse after you leave a tech conference. It's the sort of thing you do when a spouse dies. It's the sort of thing you do when you move to another city. It's the sort of thing you do when a child is born or a child leaves your home. So it's the sort of thing you do after divorce. You have to pick a moment when you can really cleave into it because it's tough. It's not a thing to do on impulse. I don't urge you to do it right now. I urge you to think about it. I think you should go home, catalog what you got, morally prepare yourself for this moment because it's going to come. When it comes in everybody's life, it's going to come in yours, probably a lot more often in your lives in the lives of people whose lives are going to be a little less turbulent. But if you're morally prepared for it, it'll actually help you lessen the shock. You'll be like, okay, I'm like ready. This is the moment I've been sort of plotting and scheming about. This is the moment where I like rid myself of this dross and come face to face with some more authentic version of myself. It's not going to hurt you to lose all these things. You don't really need them. After you go through this particular discipline, you will look different, you will act differently, you will become much more what you already are. Thank you for your attention.